And good day. On behalf of the Oregon State University School of Public Policy and the University of California School of Social Sciences, I'm delighted to welcome you to the third global conversation organized by Athena 40, a platform that promotes women's leadership by connecting women to mentoring, knowledge, and networks and opportunities to meet and join forces. My name is Bill Maurer. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Sciences at UC Irvine, and I'm so pleased that you could join us today. This is an international event, the only one of its kind, with panel discussions taking place today in parallel in different time zones, one after the other across different cities around the world. The organizing theme for this year's conversation, which also marks International Women's Day, is female leadership in times of crisis. The theme recognizes the impact of COVID-19 on women as being quite severe for a number of reasons, economic, social, professional, political, psychological, Conversations around promoting more women in decision-making roles are even more timely and important now than they were a year ago. My co-organizer and moderator for today's discussion is Professor Catherine Bolzendahl. Professor Bolzendahl is the director of the School of Public Policy at Oregon State University. As an academic leader, Professor Bolzendahl advocates for the power of social science to improve our world. And as a scholar, her research reflects an enduring commitment to addressing critical questions about political and gender inequality through international and interdisciplinary collaborations. Her work demonstrates quite clearly that we all benefit when women are politically empowered. Professor Bolzendahl. Thank you so much, Bill. It's really an honor to be here uh, co-hosting this event with you. In our long experience of working together, I know you as someone who has always been committed to supporting gender equality and women's leadership. Um, for, the panel, for the panelists, for the attendees, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. While we're having our discussion, please um, submit any questions that you have to the Q&A. Bill's going to do the job of keeping an eye on that, and we're going to open that up to some questions at the end. So please submit any questions you have. Uh, again, thank you all so much for joining us. I'm really delighted to introduce you to our panel of exceptional change-making women who will share their stories and insights with us. Full biographies of the, our panelists will be uh, put into the chat through a, a link that you can click on and learn more about all of the amazing things that they have done. So going in alphabetical order, I'd like to first introduce Bernadette Bowden Albala the Director and Founding Dean of the Program in Public Health in the Susan and Henry Samueli College of Health Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. Next, I'll introduce Julie Hill, who is the Corporate Director for Anthem and Lord Abbott Mutual Funds and the Chair of the Board of Trustees of UC Irvine, among many, many other roles. Dr. Shrey Ramkui, MD, is a surgeon health policy leader and healthcare executive. Dr. Kui was the first woman appointed deputy, deputy undersecretary for community care for the Veterans Administration. Next, we have Karen Tolliver, who is the executive vice president for creative at, so at Sony Pictures Animation. She produced the Academy Award-winning um, animated short film, Hair Love. And we have Mary Carlin Yates, who is retired from serving as a diplomat for the Department of State for 32 years and is currently an independent consultant on national security matters. Thank you panelists for being here today. To start our conversation, I'd like to ask each of you to please talk a bit about your own backgrounds and share a personal statement or story that has defined who you are today and how you think about women's leadership. Bernadette, can you um, start us off? Sure, and first of all, Happy International Women's Day to all of mm. us. And I'm um, very, very excited to be here among this very prestigious group of women. Um, so um, I am um, right now the founding dean of public health at UCI. And really, my entire work has been focused on um, health disparities. And I've done a lot of work in stroke, cardiovascular disease. But this last year, as I call it, the longest year, um, has really been a challenge, um, really working in a new place. I had just joined UCI in this role, not there more than 
four or five months and, um, and COVID hit. And, uh, you know, one of the really wonderful things, um, or at least one of the things that I've always tried to do, I consider myself a builder, a builder of schools, a builder of relationships, you know, nationally, regionally, and locally. And I, and I just want to go and tell you this story, which probably is a little bit more about COVID and maybe less about me, but I think that it, it hopefully sets the tone. So I would say early on, maybe March, April, May, as um, we're talking about things like mask wearing and social distancing, um, I've, I've been building all these relationships with um, government leadership and community leadership. And I get a call and, and a part of building these relationships is, you know, I would, we want to help support whatever we can support in the community and vice versa. And I get a call from a government leader who says to me, you know, I've done so much for you and I've done so much for UCI and I've done so much and I need you, I need a favor. I'm getting a lot of political pressure to move the mandate to wear masks to a recommend wearing masks. And I'd like you to stand by me because you know we're collaborative. And I'd like you to say that we can move that mandate. We can say no more mandate. We just recommend it. And I, I have to say, I was really taken aback. And I thought, you know, I had take, it had taken so long to build this relationship. But, um, but I, I know what the science said and it demonstrated. And I, call, I called him back up and I said, you know, here's the thing. You're, 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 getting coerc you're being coercive to me. People are coercing you to change this policy. You need to tell them. Science demonstrates that masks are protective, that masks halt disease, that masks save lives. You need to go back and you need to do that. I will stand by you for that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, he actually used my statement, but, um, but went to recommend. The good news is the policy um, was overturned. But, but I think that's part of what we're seeing in women in leadership, and especially in COVID, is that science has become a negotiation. Um, and so I feel as a builder that I need to be a defender of science. And so, so that just sort of illustrates, I think, the pressure that we have all been under this year. Turn it back to you, Catherine. Absolutely, thanks so much. Julie. Hi, first of all, it's really great to be here celebrating women's leadership. And I should mention that today would have been my mother's 104th birthday. So I'm going to celebrate her as well as we start. And she'd be proud of all of us. She was a pioneer in her own right. Um, so my background, I've, I've been in business most of my life, although I had, when I started out, I taught junior high school for two years because I had a, guy, a high school guidance counselor who said to me when I said I want to be in business, this is a direct quote, pretty little girls like you become bitches on wheels in business. I was at 16. I was impressionable. I got a teaching degree. I, I felt like I was in the Peace Corps. I taught in Chicago. And then I went back and got a master's degree because I believed I, I should be in business. So I became a CEO when um, I was asked to run the US operations of a British company. The company is called Custain. It built the channel under the English channel. So all very male, uh, very hardcore, heavy engineering and mining. And I ran their US operations. I was the only female in a, in a leadership role and I was blonde and I was from California. So there were a lot of things going on in my relationship with that company. But when they decided to sell out the land development interests in the US, I bought them out, became an entrepreneur, started my own company. I've done public company board work with a number of companies, some of them international, and I do a lot of philanthropic work. I love UCI, the university where I chair the board of trustees. Um, but you asked us to tell a little story that might be, might be formative. So I'll tell a story about my wise woman. Um, I don't know what else to call her. She was probably the best mentor I ever had. She was not in business. She was just very wise. And she said to me one time, do you know why you've been successful? And I said, yes, I've worked my buns off. And she said, I would submit to you that it's something else. She said, I've watched and I've noticed that you always said yes at the door. And I thought about that. And I thought about the fact that quite often women don't do that. And maybe that did make a difference. And that's the best thing I think I could say to women starting out is because if you don't say yes, you'll never know. And headhunters, um, HR people will tell you that if there's a job description with 10 requirements that men will apply if they only have three or four. 
but women hold themselves to a higher standard. They have to have eight, nine, or 10. So the say yes at the door, I think is the best thing that I could say to anyone. You'll figure it out on the other side of the door. You'll surprise yourself. You'll keep yourself entertained and engaged. But when you're doubting yourself, jump to that side that says yeah, say yes at the door. Thanks. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Cooley. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's such a privilege to be here and to be a part of this panel of truly amazing women. I am just humbled to be here. About me, um, I'm Sriram Kui. I'm a general surgeon. I operate and I take care of patients. Also, I'm involved in health policy and in healthcare leadership. I've spent the past two uh, decades of my career taking care of veterans and taking care of low-income women and uh, children. And I think one of the defining stories about my um, journey in leadership is when I first took on the role as Chief Medical Officer for the state of Louisiana's Medicaid program. And when I started in that role, Louisiana had one of the highest rates of opioid overdose deaths in the country. And we had more opioid prescriptions per capita than people. That's, that's including children and babies in that population. And um, so when I started tackling the opioid crisis in Louisiana at the time, there was a great deal of resistance um, to change. But to make change, to save lives, you have to change that resistance into collaboration. And that's what we did. We hosted educational seminars to teach physicians and the community about safe opioid prescribing. <clears throat> we reached out to leadership of the Louisiana Pain Society, the Medical Society leadership, and we asked for their help. We asked them to come and speak at our symposiums and to be a part of teaching the community about safe opioid prescribing. We went to our state legislators and we brought them the data drilled down to their parishes that showed how opioid overdose deaths in their parish among their constituents was higher than the deaths from homicides and motor vehicle crashes. And when you can show that level of data, that's when you really engage people. And we, we also enacted bold reg regulation that uh, aligned opioid prescribing with CDC guidelines. And this wasn't easy to accomplish. But a year later, we reduced opioid prescriptions among Medicaid patients by 40%. But I think equally important is that a year after our work began, some of our toughest critics were on the Senate floor testifying in support of legislation to alleviate the opioid crisis. So what I learned from, from that experience is that leading during a crisis requires having the courage to, to take bold actions, but equally important, leading during crisis requires the humility to ask for help and the willingness to bring all voices to the table. And, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I will turn now to Karen, please. Thank you. Well, I'm still sort of in awe of being uh, with you uh, women. Uh, I'm usually only in entertainment conversations. So to be talking to you esteemed ladies and all of your amazing fields, it's pretty pretty remarkable. So thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, my name is Karen Tolliver. I've been in um, animation for over 20 years. And when I think about sort of, you know, last year I won the Oscar uh, for Hair Love. Uh, I was the first African-American woman to win in that category. And when I think about leadership, I think I think about the irony of me talking about leadership because I am a was a shy, nerdy girl, you know, from Texas who joined animation over live action because I really didn't want to be on set with actors and sort of the limelight of that. I really wanted to just tell stories that were powerful. And over the years, really, you know, honed my craft, got an opportunity to do a project sort of as a passion project outside of my day-to-day -day job, and that was Hair Love. And when I, when we were nominated, we realized there were only nine other um, black um, talent across all the categories to be nominated. I think that's where it was a very, it was very ironic for me to have to step into that space of, of being the first possible and what that meant for other people and other women and other people of color that were sort of looking up to and wanting to kind of reach that brass ring. So I really had to sort of own that, um, that position to really realize that, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. It certainly was something that was part of my uh, career as I looked up to others to try to emulate them. Um, but I think the thing that was the most powerful that I take away from this experience was 
we got an award from the city of Los Angeles for the work that Hair Love did. It became sort of a cultural conversation around black representation that was sorely missed for sure in the entertainment industry overall, but certainly in, anim in animation. And you know, with all of the political unrest and, and social activity that we've seen in the past few years, what the politician said in giving us this award was, you know, you can create all of the policy that you want, but entertainment really helps you change hearts and minds. And that's really the most, one of the, the most challenging things to do in a society. Um, and I, I really took that to heart. So I had to sort of step into a very uncomfortable role for myself of being that representative and really trying to bring other people into this. So leadership is not sort of a maybe a natural place that you may think, everybody may not start wanting to be a leader. You may find yourself in that role. Um, for me, the importance and the passion and the things that we can do around that's so important that you sort of have to really kind of understand what all that is. And I'm, I'm just grateful to be part of that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see so many connective threads in our conversations here. This is fantastic. Thank you. Um, Mary. <clears throat> Thanks so much, uh, Julie, and thank you for being part of this and congratulations for International Women's Day uh, for women all over the world. I feel like I, could, like I would like to be responding to everyone else who's already spoken, um, but um, as you said, I was a diplomat for 30 plus years and uh, I'm still involved in uh, foreign affairs, but I'm also still a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and uh, a big fan of Oregon State students. Um, but when I began diplomacy, it was really a, a white male world at that time in the 80s. And actually, my first uh, ambassador in Korea sent a cable in saying that they wanted the assignment broken. They didn't think a woman could ever succeed as a diplomat in Korea. So that was quite a welcoming um, to the Foreign Service. And uh, following that, um, I, in the 90s, had two female ambassadors as role models, first in the Congo and then in Paris, and they were amazing mentors for me. Um, <clears throat> but uh, speaking much later in my life, I got to uh, follow a role model who was amazing and accompany Michelle Obama to South Africa. But she had gone to speak to a forum of young African women leaders, most of them under 25 years of age. Most of them had started their own NGOs working in fields like um, health or domestic abuse or uh, microfinancing. And she said to them, you know, she, she was there to applaud them. We had brought them, brought them together from all over Sub-Saharan Africa. And she said, you don't have to have a world stage to make a difference. You can do it right in your own communities. And that's what they were doing. That was their lesson um, in leadership at such young ages. But unquestionably, I think the lessons I learned in leadership came from often overlooked women in Africa. <clears throat> I could give you dozens of stories, as people say I like to tell stories, but two quick examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. One, I was sent from Paris to Bujumbura, Burundi as ambassador. And this is a country, a beautiful country, but it had been war torn for over 10 years of civil war, 250,000 dead. And my mandate, my diplomatic mandate was to alleviate suffering, to uh, uh, talk about the human rights abuses and to bring peace. Um, so within the first month, I, I decided to visit one of the embassy supported feeding centers, a malnutrition center for the women and children. And when I got there, I was amazed. It was an all female operation from the Italian nuns who would get in trucks and go into the hinterland and bring these uh, survivors back uh, to the NGO volunteers to then the women, the recovering women. But what was so amazing, they arrived emaciated, they were lined up and fed by others. But then as they grew stronger, they joined the team and they uh, did the cooking and they played with the children and they sorted the clothing donations. And I thought to myself, you have given more than sustenance to these women, you have restored their human dignity. 
And just one last story, here I go. But my final posting after I was at the White House was in Khartoum, Sudan. And once again, it was a country that was in a civil war between Sudan and South Sudan. And of course, the men had been going to Ethiopia, neighboring Ethiopia, to work on peace negotiations for almost a year but no women were invited to go to that uh, peace discussion. And so the women from South and from Sudan, they got together themselves. They came up with an agenda. They had some proposed solutions and then they got themselves to Ethiopia and they earned their place at the table. Um, and, and what I say today is I continue to learn from African uh, female leaders, and I am sure some of them are working hard on the pandemic to find solutions. So anyway, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and I look forward to this discussion. Hi, hey, listening to all of you, I, I get goosebumps thinking about all of the amazing things that um, you're doing for our world and the experiences that you've seen and the insights you've shared. I think a, a logical transition then is to ask you a question about um, based on all of these wonderful insights, we're seeing some evidence, some um, arguments about how in our current um, crisis with the, with the pandemic and other kinds of issues that we're facing, that it's actually women-led nations or women-led initiatives that are having a better, better handle on the crisis, <clears throat> um, that are better at dealing with some of these crisis type situations. Given some of the things that you've just shared with us and your own experiences, do you see validity to that claim? And, and what do you think would contribute to that? I, I'll, I'll start first by saying um, that there was a Harvard study in 2019, which really was looking at leadership um, traits among women and men and found that women really excelled in competencies like taking initiative, acting with resilience, practicing self-development, driving for results and displaying high integrity and honesty. And, and I, I wanna add to that, that I think that women have an extraordinary capacity for empathy. I think partially due to the struggles that we all regularly face. And, and maybe those sort of lived realities, the persistent disparities that we've all had to go through. And, you know, Mary, you just talked about the women in Africa. I, I've done work in Africa as well. You know, that maybe all of that positions all of us sort of to better empathize with others and to effectively respond to the challenges. And when we're talking about COVID, we're really talking about challenges of disparities. We're talking about challenges of inequity. We're talking about defending science. And, and so we're talking about all of the things that women have been characterized as traits that have characterized them as great leaders really being used. And, and I, I think the other thing is sort of defender of truth, not, you know, not negotiating with a virus. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, it's insane. There are things you do to halt a virus. And, and it seems that women have really embraced that and said, I'm going to follow the science, whereas th there's more wishy-washy decisions with others. So Katie, I'll, I'll follow that. Uh, what made me think of this is the mentioning of the um, Harvard study. One of, one of the seminal studies that I remember as I was um, stepping into leadership roles was a study that was printed in the uh, Harvard Business Review in 1996. And it was by Dr. Judy Rosner. And it was when we were first starting to understand the differences between male and female leadership. And her thesis was not that one was better than the other, but that they were different. And one of the factors that I remember from that study that pointed it out were that women wanted to share power, women wanted to share information, women wanted everybody to feel good about it, and that women were natural collaborators. And there's been subsequent studies about, I think the, the hormone is oxytocin that makes women collaborate. It's the kind of thing that we had learned to do uh, to protect our children together. I mean, it's just part of our DNA. So I think it's both intellectual and its nurture, nature and nurture um, debate. But I, I've often thought about that study and I've thought about how 
the women that I know, I, I started noticing some of these countries that were doing so much better. And I started telling everybody I knew, have you noticed New Zealand? Have, have you noticed Germany? Have you noticed what's going on? I didn't realize it was as many. But I think when we talk about the things that come out of the, um, the whole COVID experience, I think this needs to be one of the most important things that we continue to talk about. Validating all of these skills, all of these innate kinds of understanding, your, your word Bernadette, empathy, I think that's the word I was searching for. Um, we seem to have some of this naturally and let's talk about that in the way that we lead going forward. I think it's something that's extremely important. We talk about resetting, we talk about coming back new and fresh. And this is a great opportunity. Can I just add one point? And because I agree with everything that's been said, the idea of <clears throat> collaboration. Um, and in my experience in an embassy in a crisis like this, you know, you would first have to integrate the entire embassy community to try and get people evacuated on planes and, and deal with all the crisis that were immediate. But I think what's really important is the multilateral uh, cooperation that has to happen and I think was so sadly missing in our country and I don't mean to get political but you you have to be able to work with others and other nations and this is n never easy uh, but that's why we've established organizations like the WHO um, and you go and they learned some hard lessons during Ebola and they did some to uh, reevaluate what what needed to be got done in the time of the next crisis but I think <clears throat> that we as a nation didn't do ourselves any favor from now and going forward by at that exact time not having the leadership and stepping away from this one organization where we could all multilaterally cooperate. You know, I, I say sarcastically how different it might have been if the election in 2016 would have been different. <clears throat> and we'd had a female leader too. Here, here, Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add on to what, what you all have said about the importance of collaboration and, and, and empathy. And these are just leadership traits that are so critical during a crisis, whether you're in a pandemic or whether you're in like when we went through Hurricane Harvey in Houston or looking at the opioid crisis, any, any crisis, where as a leader, if you have the ability to bring people together and it's not just you on your own, like as a surgeon, when I'm in the operating room, I know it's not just me operating, it's every single team member from the janitor who cleans that operating room to make sure my patients don't get infections. And as we saw in the pandemic, you know, I've, I'm so proud of the job that the VA has done in, in its response during the pandemic, but everyone took ownership. Everyone said, this is something that we're fighting together. And I remember going to the operating room in the, in the middle of all of this when it was just starting in April. And there was this lady who was part of our environmental management services, wiping down all the surfaces with disinfectant wipes. And I said, thank you. Thank you for doing this. And she said, I'm just doing my part. This is how I'm taking care of our veterans. And that comes back to when you honor the, the, the contribution of everyone at the table, that's the mark of a true leader. And so I say here, here to what you all have said. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think Karen too of the crises, you know, that obviously the entertainment industry isn't dealing with COVID in a day-to-day -day basis, but it's been, it's had to completely shift, you know, and so many things have had to change. And it was already going through a reckoning with, uh, re with regard to gender and race and, um, you know, some inequalities. Do you have any insights based on, on that? Sure, yeah, and again, just um, agree with everyone, everything everyone has said, but I think that in the empathy part being very important, um, understanding women being marginalized kind of makes you be empathetic and set the table for everyone to be part of the table. But I think in a moment of clear uncertainty, I think that female leaders have the ability to kind of walk through that and not, you can't be certain in uncertainty. You have to embrace that and know that you don't know and you have to work through it. And I think that we've definitely found that reckoning, as you said, in terms of, you know, just the market, the theatrical market for us is changing under our feet. 
Um, it's been a really difficult time. And I have the pleasure of having an almost all female leadership at Sony Animation. And the conversations and the way that we talk about us moving through uncertainty gives me comfort. You know, if, if uh, people ex expected to have all the answers, I think that would be the, the most, the biggest lie there is, right? So um, I think that having open and, and vulnerable conversations around race too is really, is really difficult. Um, and again, I've really applaud the leadership that I have in our group um, to sort of navigate those conversations with care. Um, it's not easy and it really kind of um, makes us have to really, um, you know, just be, be very careful um, that we don't kind of regress into what was safer before. And I think that's really, I applaud the leadership in our group. Karen, can I just pick up on one of the things that you said, uh, the word ambiguity, that was also in that early um, Harvard Business Review study on women's leadership, it was a higher capacity for women to deal with ambiguous situations. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I'll just say, you know, because I've been thinking about intersectionality a lot in terms of race and gender. And I did a panel, I'm a member of Women in Animation, and just had a panel of women in animation of color um, just for fun, because we'd never really all been in the same room together, a lot of um, in different uh, capacities. And we sort of posed the question of what are the bigger challenges, um, the tackling race or tackling gender? And I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you women have sort of been in, in your industries and worlds, and if you've had conversations around that, I was really surprised by the answer. Uh, the answer was gender. And it makes all the sense in the world to me now, but it was a very uh, illuminating conversation because I think that the complexities of being a woman in, in any industry is, is much more nuanced in terms of the, the challenges that we face amongst other women. How we sort of lead um, as women is, is very much more complicated, I think, in some ways than the race conversation. And that, that's very hard for me to say, but, it, but it's true. And I think, Karen, to your point, we're, we're really at a pivotal moment right now. Um, women have been hurt tremendously um, in this COVID crisis, right? Because we, are, um, we have disproportionately increased our caregiving of children, of aging parents. And, and what about, how does that, uh, how do we try to reconcile that with um, our career trajectory? Um, we, you know, we know that the impact on higher education has been really horrific. Publication rates have been declining with women. And so if we are in this bad place. There are not that many women leaders out there in COVID, with COVID, leading on COVID. Um, and we, we have to make sure that we do not go back, but that we really move forward. So critical, critical time right now. And if there was any way to take all of what we've all been talking about, you know, and say, these are the really important leadership roles that everybody needs to embrace to get out of this and move us forward. And then, then we really have to think about, given where we are now, given where, you know, my, my, my daughter, um, who I hope is listening, um, was saying that she was talking to a kindergarten teacher the other day, who said, these kids are coming in a full year earlier. They don't even know how to climb stairs together anymore. So we have real problems out there. It calls for all the qualities that we have as women, but we have to try to figure out how to shift this infrastructure because women, not only do women need to be leaders, but women need our help right now more than ever to get out of what is a very serious situation. Catherine, Katie, can I just add the idea that um, not going, not going in reverse, not going backwards with the steps we've made forward uh, as women, women in leadership. You know, I can remember for the last 10 or 15 years, the debate when women wanted to stay home, take care of the children, telecommute. And, you know, there was always the suspicion that you weren't going to be working when you telecommuted, you know, you were going to be cheating. Um, and, and so, I think we've gotten past that since we're all Zoom exhausted. But um, now I think the worry is going to be when the switch goes back on and many people will go back, but 
women and men have proven they can work from home. So it would only be logical that more women, whether you're a caretaker for a senior parent or taking care of your children will choose to work from home. So then do we go back to the fact that the men are going into the office five days a week and the women will go just a couple days a week. And so then what happens to promotions? And I just think we have to keep that in our minds as sort of a warning. Can, can I go back to Karen's question um, about should it be gender or should it be ethnicity? I, I find that to be a really thoughtful, engaging question. And I guess what I could say coming from a perspective of, of a white girl that we can be natural allies because in many cases, women in leadership are marginalized. It gives you that empathy. Um, one of the things that, that I've tried to do, there's a brilliant woman who is the Dean of the law school at UCI and Bernadette will know her. Her name is Song Richardson. She's half black, half Korean, and she happens to be an expert on implicit bias and specifically in AI. And I went to her and I said, I have been so activated by George Floyd. I just, I feel like the time is now. I went to all eight organizations that I'm involved with. And I said, we have got to put race on the agenda because otherwise I can't be involved. Otherwise I'm, I'm bored with this agenda. So Song and I came up with this just kind of evolved naturally. So these organizations said, well, what do you want us to do? And I said, I would like to give a presentation to you about what it means to be an ally. I'm learning, I'm studying. So we did this and, and we called it BYOB to begin with because we wanted to do it at five o'clock in the evening when people were relaxed, they could have a glass of wine. In a couple of cases, we actually sent people wine and nibbles so that they would relax. But then BYOB morphed into bring your own bias. And I would interview Song and I would say, what is white privilege? Let's just establish some definitions for these terms that people are hearing. What is systemic racism? Where does that start? Um, how do we become a better ally? And what I've found is that people are incredibly interested in doing this because we've kind of cracked something open. And when you said it takes a lot of vulnerability, it's a, it's a tough subject. What Song would say is uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And what I'm finding is that women are leading on this issue as well. There is a kind of a natural sisterhood that I think we can use to do that. And I would love to have that expand. Anybody listening, I'm happy to do our BYOB for your organization because it's, it's the conversation that we need to have. And again, this kind of caretaking, collaborative, um, nurturing aspect to women's natures can be applied to this issue and can help us heal. I personally think we need a truth and reconciliation, reconciliation commission. We need apologies, we need understanding. And think of the women who have led in those areas as well. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, just to be clear, you know, and I'm on a, a committee at Sony where we're working through the diversity issues through content and, and our people and, and all of that. And, and I'm very proud of what we're doing. What I mean personally is um, I'm very clear on my blackness and what I need to bring to the table in that area. And all of the, all of the work that's, that has been done because of George Floyd needs to continue. And I agree with you. I think that women are gonna lead the charge in that. And I'm very proud of what's happening and feel very hopeful that we're gonna make some meaningful change. Um, I mean, in terms of my womanness, in terms of navigating the industry, that's just a, it's a more complicated issue in terms of how do I present as a woman and be effective in the industry. Um, and um, I think that that implied bias around gender is probably one of the most important things that people can continue to get trained and retrained on. Yeah. Yeah. Can I jump in on that and ask you all, I, I love all of the um, wonderful strengths and opportunities that you've raised, but what are those challenges as women leaders? Like what are the ongoing challenges that are going to stop um, women leaders from getting where they need to be from from bringing these things to the table and what do we need to be tackling well mary said one of them and that's that's child care until we can figure that out women are not ever going to have equal opportunity because we have a tradition that it's women's responsibilities right child care and i think you should we need to throw um elder care in there as well 
Um, and two, if we have different spaces, as Mary talked about, if some of us are working from home and some of us are working, how do we equalize, you know, um, merit? What, what do, how do we define that? Um, and the other thing is, if you, if you think back to a lot of what we talked about as qualities that women have, right? Um, you know, some people are going to consider those qualities Oh, they're qualitative as opposed to quantitative qualities, right? They are that that somehow they're a soft science, you know, as somebody who does, I do, I'm a social epidemiologist. So I combine my soft science and my hard science, but, but it, it shouldn't be like that, right? It should be that these are important qualities, but they never get the same recognition as sort of the hard, sort of what has been thought of for sort of men's leadership qualities, you know? We're also not allowed to be aggressive. We're not allowed to be assertive. Um, and so I, I, I think these are I think these are real challenges. Getting everyone to agree that these what these characteristics that we bring to the table are are just as good, if not better. How do and and, and should be rewarded? Hey, Ram. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask if you could. Um, reflect on that because you've been involved in these big government agencies, you know, for the state of Louisiana, but also with the Veterans Administration. I think I think of the Veterans Administration as kind of a male dominant institution. Um, do you have any reflections on that? Absolutely, Katie. And I would go even further back. I, I'd go into surgery and, and say that that is truly historically a, a very male dominated um, uh, specialty. It's, it's a field that historically had been very challenging for women to get into. And I'm extraordinarily grateful to all the women who, and, and the men who helped, who, who have pioneered the way so that I could be a surgeon. But even then, you know, my, my training was like um, two decades, 15 years ago. And, and still what, what I've seen is that um, there's, there's definitely challenges. Um, I, I think the biggest solution to these challenges is having women in the leadership roles. Because by having women, then we can extend the ladder to allow more people of diversity to climb up. And, and I think that's really important that once you get to that point of um, authority, that, that point of being able to make a difference, make sure that you continue to help those who come after you. I, I really, I think that that is such an important point that it's not just about you and your success, but once you do manage to get up to there through whatever challenging profession or, or field you are, do everything you can to make it easier for those who come after you. Um, and I, I, I think I've tried to do that the best I could. When, when I was a chief medical officer for Louisiana Medicaid, I had the opportunity to hire a lot of the new leaders because we were in a new administration. And one of the things I did was to recruit widely. I think that if you don't recruit um, in a diverse pool, you will not get diverse applicants. If you do not make this opportunity available to everyone to apply for, you are not going to, and if you don't actively go out to recruit um, for diverse applicants, you're just not going to get that. And so I'm really proud that my, my team, when, when I was chief medical officer, all my section chiefs were extraordinarily talented. They also happened to be women and many of them from very diverse backgrounds. But the most important thing was they were extraordinarily accomplished. They accomplished so much and I owe any successes that we had, whether on the front of making sure that women could for the first time get access to breast cancer treatment or making sure that we could decrease opioid numbers or to, to improve access. I credit all to all these amazing women in my, my program um, who were the section leaders. So, I, I think that um, I've, I've seen some of the challenges that you that, that I've been in in surgery or in healthcare administration. And what I try to do is to learn from those experiences, to not make those same mistakes or have people go through what I went through, but also to make sure that we help others succeed. Thank you. And I think that's a good transition into a question I wanted to pose to you all about. There's a lot of young people watching this panel right now, young men and women who um, would love to benefit from your advice. What's your advice to the next generation of women leaders and the men who support them? Uh, 
Well, one good thing would they they could look around and see what women did during the crisis. That would be very helpful. <clears throat> and the ability to rise to the occasion. Um, you know, I, I, I have a son who's a millennial and some of these questions they've already figured out. They're much more egalitarian. They don't have the same issues that we have with um, childcare. They think that institutions they can get involved with that will help. So I guess my, my best advice is just find something that you're good at and then insist on that being utilized. Find ways that that can be utilized for good. I have to say, um, be vocal mm -hmm. and um, create a system of networks that will hear your voice and that you can listen to the voices of others. Because <clears throat> people need to do this together. Change is not one person. It's much harder to change as one person changing as opposed to um, a network or a system. And, you know, I'm optimistic if we can just get out of the conundrum that we're, I think, in now, which is, you know, as Mary said, we don't have great national leadership even now on vaccine. We do have real significant problems. I, I think about my faculty here, just as one example, um, where, you know, people who were in this child care, elder care situation had to, de you know, chose to, because they were programs, to defer things like uh, merits and promotions till next year. But I worry that next year is not going to be easier. It's not like next year we're going to free up all this time that you can work on all of the things. So I think we have to readjust. And, and everybody needs to talk about that because that's the only only way that we're going to normalize it. I, I think I would add, Katie, um, in, in my advice to the next generation of women is to believe in yourself. And I know that sounds like a, a Disney line, but I absolutely, <laughs> I, I hold to that because I think when I was a young woman, there's a lot of times I didn't believe myself and a lot of imposter syndrome. And, and I, I don't remember who said that, whether it was Bernadette or Judy, Julie, who said um, that uh, women think they have to have nine or 10 qualities or maybe 12 qualities to apply for some position. And um, that, that's not a, a trait that's always shared by others. But I, I would say, believe in yourself, regardless of what the rest of the world tells you believe in your dreams and hold fast to it. It doesn't matter if everyone says you're not good enough. If you know that you're good enough, if you know what you're capable of doing it, keep going. It doesn't matter if people tell you to quit. It doesn't matter if they say that you don't look like someone who should be in that role, or if they say that you don't um, sound like or come from the background of someone who should be in that role. If you believe you're capable of doing it, go out and do it. And that's a lot easier to say than to actually do. But I would say, look at this amazing panel of women, you know, from being a, an ambassador to executive vice president to deans and to all these directors. You see all these women who have done it. Believe in yourself and, and don't let anyone else tell you that you can't. And that's why I say give yourself permission to say yes at the door. Yeah, yeah that, that's totally right say yes and just do it. Someone, someone just called me last week and said, I don't think I'm qualified for this job. And I said, nobody's ever qualified for the job. You grow into it. You have the leadership skills that you need to be able to do that. I, so I agree, Julie, say yes. Also get yourself great <clears throat> mentors, whether they're your parents, your moms, your, you know, your, your, a work colleague, whoever it is, because you always, you need someone to continue to help nurture your, your confidence and your career trajectory. And at whatever age you are, get yourself a good mentor. I'm going to be calling Mary. And, uh, but, but I do, I do think that, um, I think that that's really, really important because that allows somebody else to speak up for you. And if you have a mentor and you're not feeling it, it's just not happening, move forward, move on. The worst thing you can do is have a mentor that's not really mentoring you, that, 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 that is not moving you forward. 
I would say in my career, I never, I looked for a mentor. I never got like the official mentor. And so sometimes mentorship doesn't look like you think it does. You know, I get insight from everyone, no matter what level they could be my assistant. And I get some insight from them that I hadn't had. So think about mentorship in a, in a more global way. You know, I think off the shoulders of every woman and man, anyone that's had an accomplishment, you can learn from them. I literally last week, I had an informational meeting with a young lady and I realized that there was a barrier, she saw a barrier to entry to get to my position, that I talked to many young women and men and didn't realize that there was a misconception about how to get the job that I have. It was an amazing moment. I'm not her official mentor, I'm there for her, but it was like, it was an amazing thing and I wanna share insights. I think you can really get that information in just a casual conversation as well. Can I just throw in something about this queen bee uh, syndrome? So when I started my um, career in a very male dominated field, there was only one other woman in Southern California who was in construction. And I literally was introduced to her five times for the first time because she would never recognize me. She didn't want anybody else in her field. She did her best not to mentor me. So I would say that one of the things that piece of advice is be a mentor. It doesn't matter at whatever level you're at, but be a mentor to another woman and help bring a sister along. And if I could add one thing on mentoring, uh, don't overlook the fact that men can be amazing mentors. Um, in the four years I spent, spent with the US military, um, and I went to work, it was truly Venus landing in Mars and this male world. And um, the two four stars I worked for were incredible. And one of them said to me, my job was POLAD, political advisor. Uh, and and the, in the first meeting, he said, take this job to whatever heights you want. Uh, do new things, you know, come out of the box and, and convince everyone here why defense and diplomacy are absolutely equal and we need them both in our national security toolkit. And I thought, wow, and with those, uh, that win behind me, I went on and I took the risk and I went for the next big job, which was a equivalent of the deputy commander of the new Africa force, I never would have done that without the encouragement of these men. So I think men can be amazing mentors and especially sort of encouraging you to be risk takers. Absolutely. Um, that I could sit here and listen to you all talk for, for hours. This is so wonderful. But I know that our audience has also been loving this conversation and they have questions that they would like to pose. So Bill, could I ask you to um, offer the panelists one of our audience questions? Sure, um, the, and thank you all so much for this incredible conversation. It's a real privilege to be able to, to sit here and, and learn from you. Um, now, one that I think may have just been answered came from Kirk Davis, who was asking, what's the role of men in supporting women's leadership? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to say a little bit more about that. I know um, that, that Mary was just saying a few words about the importance of men as mentors, but anyone else? I, I would, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. I'd rather hear you. <laughs> I, I would say that is a wonderful question. And that's so important because uh, oftentimes the people in leadership are men and they have the opportunity to change this world and make it better. So there are so many things. It's all the things that everyone from Mary to Karen to Julie to Bernadette to Katie have, and, and to Bill have talked about is that um, whether it's changing policy so that they're family friendly, so that um, recognizing work that may not have traditionally been, you know, like lab science work, well, maybe it's some of the work that causes cultural change that saves lives just as much. So there are so many opportunities. And um, I think another big thing is not only increasing women in the pipeline to leadership, but retaining them, doing all the things to make sure they stay in those senior roles and, and continue. And I want to say huge thanks to my mentors uh, from Dr. Krumholz to Dr. Shulkin to, to Dr. Romero. They're all wonderful men, who, doctors and surgeons who have helped my career and I often call them for advice. So I'm hugely thankful. I was just going to say that the first person who offered me a position as a corporate board director was a man. Um, I had an interview with him. Um, I 
didn't think he liked me because it was literally a three hour argument. It was basically, he would say something, it, it turned out his, his um, leadership style was very in your face, very, very challenging. And it was the first time that I'd ever been challenged like that. I told my husband afterwards, oh, he'll never call me back. I mean, I, I argued with him. Turns out that was the right thing to do with that particular personality. But men will give you your first opportunity. I mean, it's, it's very frequent that, that somebody at the top in an organization is a, is a guy. So yeah, we, are, we need to be grateful. I've been grateful to him for many, many years that he picked me out. And I think that's important. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a number of questions here that all kind of get at the same general problem. And these are coming from Amy Thompson, Dana Reason, and Mirta Pesci Meyer. And they're about the problem of the way in which society often sets up women to compete against one another, or um, that you know often women in positions of power will undermine rather than you know help build um, each other's careers and each other's strengths. And then in addition, you know um, the collaboration point that you all mentioned sounds great um, in theory, but in practice, collaboration often gets seen by men as indecisiveness. Um, you know, lack of leadership. So how do we deal with the kind of perceptions around some of these qualities of women leaders um, and also the, the problem um, of, you know, training uh, women in leadership positions so that all can get lifted up instead of this thing where people are kind of tearing each other down? I'd, I'd love to jump in if I can really quickly. The, the power of collaboration, we've seen this, seen this in the pandemic and uh, about the, what you said about, you know, the lifting tide raises all boats. When the pandemic just started and, and we were in March, we were starting, we really didn't know what to do uh, medically from a standpoint. Uh, a group of doctors from across the country, uh, we were presidential leadership scholars from, you know, rural California to Emory to Johns Hopkins to small hospitals in um, uh, Texas. We all got together and we pooled our ideas as we were like working on the front lines, trying to figure out what are the best practices to combat the COVID epidemic? What are the things we need to do pr to protect our hospital staff? And traditionally, um, and how we shared it was in publications and traditionally in academia, it's about, you know, you have two, three, four publications. We had what 16 people and I had them all listed as authors and we couldn't go for the most prestigious journal because they have limits on the number of authors. Doesn't matter. We went to one that um, is, uh, it's, it's less, it's, it was New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. It's, it's not New England Journal of Medicine, but we put everyone's work out there and that's go, going back to, you know, what Julie said about not being a queen bee. We all had our names on there. We all pulled our experience and all res, our resources, and that helped. That was helping hospitals to, to, in the early phases, figure out how do you uh, uh, mobilize your resources? How do you prevent transmission and all these things? So I, I think it's, we've seen during the pandemic how valuable it is to collaborate, to have the humility to not be the queen bee and to make sure everyone gets the recognition. And you know, Bill, I, I just wanna make a comment on that question because I, I have to say, I, I sort of resent this kind of stereotype about women that they aren't um, collaborators, that they are queen bees. And then on the other hand, if we do collaborate, we're not leading. So you go back to this question about what is leadership and there's always been this one best model and it still exists. It's a male and it's a white male. So I think one of the things that we really have to do is, is take all of these learnings that have come out of this year and start to define leadership differently. It looks different than the traditional models. And you can make a, a case that, that we are not going to go forward if we go back to that kind of leadership. There's, a new, there's an advent of a new sensibility, a new understanding. And I think it's incumbent on people in leadership, uh, women in leadership particularly, to talk about this, to make this a thing, to talk about the concept that old paradigms of leadership have got to change. I'm counting on the next generations, but we can still do things in our generation. And one of the things I say to women in business is, there's this concept of shelf space. You know, how much space does a product get on a shelf? How, how big is the shelf for Tide? Our job is to expand the shelf, not to compete for the shelf space. I would just say, you know, go back to what can men do. I think 
men that understand this, particularly white men that, that understand this, there is a potential for it to seem threatening to that old system. I think they need to really be vocal about that it's okay, that there is enough room on the shelf for everyone, including white men. Um, and that that's the way that we're gonna all move forward. And actually when you get an inclusive society, it's better for everyone. Um, and I, I would just add, uh, they taught us once in the Foreign Service, you should have your one minute elevator speech about why you, you're a strong leader. Um, I think every young man and woman could have some facts in their head about the world. I mean, if women are 50% of the leadership, but only one out of every four uh, elected leaders in the, in the world or parliamentarians are, are women, you know, how does that move forward with equality? So what do we need to change? And what I would say is also these discussions can start right in your family, right at your dinner table. You can talk with your father, you can listen to your father, you can listen to your brothers, um, and you can bring up these points because minds have to change, um, you know, over a period of time and just start with that nuclear family. I think minds have to change, Mary, absolutely. And structures have to change. The fact that there is a limit on the number of authors, the fact that uh, tenure committees don't like quote unquote team science, the fact that we have to restrict the number of people we could choose to give an award to versus why don't we, why don't we do awards that are for collaboration? So it's, it's structural change that's going to really make that difference. And all at our level, we're the ones that are gonna to have to push that structural change. I love all of these points. I think that we're really drawing to some conclusions around who we are as individuals and the changes that we can make, the changes that we can make in interactions with each other, others, and the broader structural changes that need to happen. I'm so excited to see where this conversation goes in terms of all of the insights that have emerged and the other um, nine cities, I think we're up to actually 10 cities, they just added Lagos to the lineup. So all of these international, um, this chorus of wisdom, we're going to put, pull this together as a white paper and we're going to be sharing that with, with everyone. You can go to athena40forum.com where all of the information from this global conversation is listed. And uh, please be in touch, uh, keep the conversation going. I want to say a huge thanks to our panelists for making the time to share their wisdom and insights with us, to the staff and um, faculty of the University of California, Irvine, in helping us put this together and um, with Oregon State University for helping sponsor this. We are going to take all of the questions that we couldn't get to, and we're going to share those with all the panelists so that we can move forward with that. And we're gonna, and, um, and include that in our ongoing conversation. And I just would like to say, thank you so much. Bill, would you like to say anything? Um, just to say that this was phenomenal. And you know, I was a little bit worried because Katie, you'll remember last year, we did this together in person at the University Club at UC Irvine. There were sort of 200 or so people there. It was an incredible morning. And there was such energy in the room. And afterwards, people were coming up on the stage and lining up to talk with the panelists. And I thought, oh boy, we're doing this on Zoom. The energy and excitement won't be there. But you know what? This was just phenomenal. And thank you all so much. I mean, the, the, the insights that we've all gleaned and the experiences that you've shared um, really are going to help all of us think through our own role um, in the society that we hope to have. So thank you. And thanks again, Katie, for doing this. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, hopefully we see each other in person again soon. And um, let's all stay in touch. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.